Good morning. Welcome to St. John as we gather together on this ninth Sunday after Pentecost. It is always great to be in God's house. Uh, it's great to be back in God's house. Speaking of that, last night we resume Saturday evening service up in the sanctuary. Apparently we had a larger than average turnout. So that was great for everyone who joined uh, for Saturday evening. So those services now have started, 4.30 p.m. on Saturdays. Um, let's see, one other announcement. So if you've been here in previous weeks or months, you may have noticed that the four tables are now gone. Uh, so we'll have you come forward during communion distribution, uh, generally spaced out here uh, in front of the altar, um, but perhaps more spaced out than we used to be. So we'll try to leave some space between individuals or family groups, uh, but we will distribute communion probably similarly to what you're accustomed to, uh, except Pastor Luke and I will have masks and gloves on. So we'll tell you more about that when that happens. But uh, otherwise, we begin this morning with our opening hymn, Today Your Mercy Calls Us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we 
confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Though we do not deserve your goodness, still you provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may acknowledge your gifts, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost comes from Isaiah chapter 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Hear, that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the people's a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. This is the word of the Lord. We recite responsively selected verses from Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens. His love endures forever. Who made the great lights, his love endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night, his love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. 
The epistle lesson is from Romans chapter 9, and as has been the case during this summer, it also serves as the basis for this morning's sermon. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the Alleluia verse. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Now when Jesus heard about the death of John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over, and those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the gospel of the Lord. We stand together and confess our shared Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the begotten of His Father.
be seated for the hymn of the day, The Church's One Foundation. <laughs> brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I have here a book called the Bible Promise Book, and in it are various different topics with a variety of Bible passages that pertain to each topic. And glancing at the table of contents, the topics, topics include things like Anger and children, forgiveness, hope, shame, worry, and so on. So if I need to hear from God's word about any one of these particular issues, 
I can jump to that section and read a handful of passages that speak to that issue. For example, if I'm struggling with worry, I can go to the worry section and read verses like 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxieties on God because he cares for you. So a book or resource like this is a quick and easy way to find a passage that speaks directly to your situation concerning any particular topic. But if you're worried or anxious, the last thing you'd want to do is open up your Bible and kind of randomly stumble across a passage like Acts 5, where God kills Ananias and Sapphira for lying to the Holy Spirit. Or maybe stumbling across 2 Kings 2, where God sends two bears to kill 42 teenagers for making fun of the prophet Elijah. Elisha, rather. Reading passages like these probably won't help you with your worry or anxiety. It's a bit safer to find a pre-selected verse and read from there. While using a book like this or Googling passages for a given topic can be very helpful, I know it's helped me a lot, bringing me comfort or peace in various situations, there is a danger in reading the Bible only in one or two verse snippets. In other words, plucking Bible verses out of their context misses the bigger, deeper, and richer story of God's Word. In my college and seminary classes, one of the biggest mistakes one could make was misinterpreting a Bible passage by taking it out of its context. That is, completely removing it from the verses and chapters surrounding it, removing it from the rest of the book it came from, and ultimately removing it from the overall narrative of the entire Bible. Again, not that reading one or two specific scripture verses is wrong. It's a good thing to do. It's just that when we only read the Bible this way, we can easily end up twisting God's word. If I pluck a verse out of its context, I can easily begin to make it say whatever I want it to say, rather than what God is saying. We then become the arbiters of God's word rather than God. We fashion God's word into our image, twisting it into what we want it to say. This is, of course, nothing new. All the way back in Genesis 3, Satan twisted what God told Adam and Eve. Did God really say? God's word has always been twisted into saying things God never intended it to say. But perhaps less drastically, when we approach the Bible by only reading a verse or two without paying attention to God's wider story, we in a way actually remove ourselves from God's story. All of Scripture is one narrative. It's one cohesive unit that tells God's story of salvation. Furthermore, the Bible tells us about God's people and how God has brought them into his story. Christianity isn't just a private religion. It's not just me and Jesus. And God's word isn't just something we only turn to when we're feeling bad or need God to bail us out of something. We don't bring God into our personal stories by reading a few Bible verses here and there. Rather, God has brought us into his story. As we've been working through Romans this summer, we've seen how Paul is turning our attention to God's greater story. And in his greater story, God is the main character, not us. But we've become a part of this story. And today we're going to see how God, God's greater story involves a greater people. God's greater people. While God is certainly present with individual persons, especially when a person reads a comforting Bible passage about worry or guilt or pain, God's story really is so much greater than all of that. Dr. David Schmidt states, God has come in Jesus Christ not only to save you and each person in the entire creation, but also to join you to a people, a people who live by his promise and for his purpose in his kingdom. This is what the Apostle Paul reveals in our text. 
And this is what God calls us to rejoice in today. So turning to our text from Romans 9, given what precedes it immediately in its context, it may feel a little strange. Romans 8, of course, is full of wonderful passages. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And then the chapter wraps up with these amazing words. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. As far as chapters in the Bible go, Romans 8 is probably one of the more in chapters in all of Scripture. The lectionary spends three weeks on this one chapter, and it's certainly one of my personal favorites. But as I've been saying, you shouldn't disconnect Romans 8 from its context, and you can't separate it from what follows it in chapter 9. Paul continues, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So what is, Paul, what is Paul talking about here? It feels like Paul went from a joyful preacher of the gospel in chapter 8 to some sort of gloomy gust in chapter 9. Jeez, Paul, get it together, man. Can't you just stay joyful? Well, this is what Paul's getting at. He knows the joy that he's received from God, that there is no condemnation of him because he belongs to Christ. That his current sufferings, suffering isn't worth comparing to his future glory. That God is working all things in Paul's life for his good. And that nothing can separate him from Christ. Paul joyfully clings to the promises Christ has given him and all Christians. Paul trusts that Christ really has made him one of God's people. Paul recognizes that Jesus has brought him, the chief of sinners, into God's greater story. Paul knows and believes this. What's troubling Paul is that most of his people, the Jews, the Israelites, have rejected Christ as the Messiah. In doing so, most of his kinsmen, his Jewish brothers and sisters, have rejected God's promises. They've separated themselves from the love and joy found in Christ. They've refused to be God's greater people. And they've removed themselves from God's greater story. And this breaks Paul's heart. What we have here in the first part of Romans 9 is a deeply personal prayer from Paul concerning this issue. Have you ever earnestly prayed over a family member or friend who doesn't believe in Jesus? Has your heart been broken over someone you deeply care about walking away from the faith? Have you lifted up painful prayers on behalf of that loved one? Well, this is what we're seeing with Paul here. He's sharing with us his sorrow and anguish over the Jewish people that have rejected Jesus. He wishes that he could swap places with them, that he would be cursed and cut off from Christ rather than those he cares for. A rather Christ-like attitude on Paul's part. And Paul lists God's gifts given first to the Israelites that his people are now rejecting. Adoption, 
glory, the covenants, the law, worship, the promises, the patriarchs, and ultimately Christ, the Messiah. All of these things are found in God's story and pertain to his promises of forgiveness, life, and salvation. But most of Paul's own people have rejected all of these things, even though that they were given specifically to them. It'd be like rejecting a personal gift or a vast inheritance or even a marriage proposal and a wedding ring, but, much, but on a much grander scale. The Jews, Paul's people, rejected their identity as God's greater people and rejected their place in God's greater story. And so we encounter Paul's very personal and painful prayer here. In praying for the Jews, notice that Paul's prayer is wrapped up in God's larger story. Paul connects his prayer to God's story of salvation. What's more, he's connecting his hearers, he's connecting us to God's story of salvation. Paul states, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Paul's arguing here that God gave his promises to Abraham and Isaac and all of their descendants, making them his people, making them people of God's promises. And God laid out these promises to Abraham in Genesis 12 and 15. And even though these promises included many things, like descendants, many descendants, a land inheritance, and so on, these promises were ultimately connected to the promise of a Savior, the sending of the Messiah to save people from sin and death, which God had already promised way back in Genesis 3. So God gave the promise of salvation to Abraham and his children. Abraham and his descendants had been made God's people and brought into God's story. However, even though God gave these promises to a specific group of people, the Israelites, Paul's arguing that being biologically Jewish doesn't automatically make you a part of God's people or God's story. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Jesus made the same argument in the Gospels, as did many of the prophets in the Old Testament. Conversely, Paul's also arguing that there, there are those who aren't biologically Jewish, but nevertheless belong to God's people. It is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Jesus also made the same argument as did the Old Testament prophets before him. In other words, God's people, the true Israel, are not those biologically descended from Abraham, but those whom God has given the gift of faith. Those who believe in Jesus are truly the people of Israel. God gave his specific promises to Abraham and the people of Israel not to exclude others, but he gave it to this specific people in order that others might also become God's people. God chose a specific people to give his promises of salvation in order that through them would come the Messiah and that through him these promises might be given to all people. Dr. Schmidt states, God has chosen Abraham to be the father of his people and from Abraham God has chosen to bless not only his people but all nations on the face of the earth. From Abraham and his descendants, According to the flesh comes Christ, and Christ is the one in whom Israel and all nations of the earth are blessed. Paul knows this greater story of God, and this story shapes Paul's life and prayer. All who believe in Jesus, regardless of their ancestry, are God's people. 
The church is the new Israel. That is to say, it's the church that are the people of the promise. We are God's people. He has brought us into his story. So God's story, revealed through the entire Bible, is now our story. The promises that God gave to Abraham and his descendants in his story are now our promises. Promises given to you that have been fulfilled by Jesus. Promises proclaiming to you that there is no condemnation of you who belong to Christ. That your current sufferings aren't worth comparing to your future glory. That God is working all things in your life for your good. And that nothing can separate you from Christ. You have been brought into God's greater story. God's narrative of salvation is now your narrative. You are the people of the promise. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Continue now with the prayers of the church. Please rise. As the scriptures proclaim, as Pastor Luke has uh, shared with us this morning, it's by faith, as the Holy Spirit is at work, as we're put into Jesus, we're blessed to be people of the promise, people of God, people who can come before our Heavenly Father in prayer. Uh, as we prepare to pray this morning, a few announcements. Um, our sister in Christ, uh, Eunice Johnson, fell asleep in Jesus on Wednesday. Uh, and so her funeral is going to be on Tuesday, visitation and funeral is going to be on Tuesday here at St. John. Uh, so we lift up Bill Johnson and family in prayer, uh, as well as uh, Connie Hoferkamp and her family as, as Connie mourns the death of her mother, Carol. So we'll pray for them as well. So let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you bid us to come before you without money to receive grace beyond price. We trust that you hear us this morning as we heed your call, as we come to you in prayer, confident of your promise to hear us and answer us in and through Jesus. Father, we, we sought meaning and comfort and sustenance from all the wrong places. Grant us your Holy Spirit that our hearts would be turned to your word, that we would hunger for your son's body and blood, and that we would discern truth from error. We thank and praise you, Lord, that you enlarge your church, that you make us into people of the promise in and through Jesus, through your word, a promise proclaimed, and that later this morning, you will call little Abel to be your child in the waters of holy baptism. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we give you thanks that you've blessed us beyond what we deserve and given to us your church. Guard her life by your spirit and strengthen her witness before the nations. Bless all pastors and church workers, teachers in their service to us in your name. And bless those now considering and preparing for church work vocations. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we too quickly focus on what we don't have and not upon your unlimited grace. We pray that you would bless all relief agencies and services of your church on behalf of the hungry, the homeless, the hurting, and those who have lost hope. Bless those who have been visited by disaster and tragedy, and open our hearts to help them recover from their loss. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we know each day that we know abundance and freedom. So bless those who defend us from our enemies who serve us in government, and who protect us in our communities. Be with our president, the Congress, our governor, and our judges and magistrates, that they would discern the right path and lead us with honor and integrity. As students and teachers, administrators and parents either have gone back to school or prepare to go back in whatever form that takes, we pray and trust that you will guide and bless uh, all those who learn and teach in our schools. Lord, in your mercy, Father, we suffer with all kinds of ills and afflictions, 
And so we pray that you would hear us this morning and grant us healing and those for whom we pray according to your will, that you would give strength in the time of trial and peace at the last. We pray especially for Bill Johnson and family as we mourn the death of our sister in Christ, Eunice, and yet rejoice that she is with all those saints who have gone before. We pray for Connie and Doug Hoferkamp as they mourn the death of Connie's mom. For all those who are on our prayer list, those who uh, are sick, those who are hospitalized, preparing for surgery or recovering for surgery, those who fight cancer, that you would bless and keep them, and those we name in our hearts. Good Lord, deliver us and teach us to depend upon your grace in all things. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we know that your steadfast love and mercy are forever. They endure forever. But our faith each day is tested and tempted. So give us strength and endure us that we would not despair, but have confidence in your grace upon grace. Guide us to seek the consolation and the certainty that comes in your word and sacrament and prepare us this morning to receive the Lord's body and blood in this holy communion. Lord, in your mercy. Father, each day we're surrounded by your love and care. Give us eyes to see your mercies new every morning and grateful hearts that would proclaim and share the giver of every good and perfect gift that we would share also with those in need. We rejoice with those who rejoice, and today celebrate with Jeff and Peggy Rohde on their 45th wedding anniversary. With all those who celebrate birthdays and anniversaries and the blessings you give, Lord, in your mercy, Father, we remember the saints who lived by your mercy and died in Christ, and we long for that day when all divisions will end and the church in heaven and, and on earth will be one in your presence, singing your praise in your kingdom without end. And so, Father, we ask you to give us all things needful and to keep us from all things harmful. And in our salvation that's found in and through Jesus, we would trust alone, rejoicing in your wisdom and love. So teach us to pray without fear that your will be done through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue now with the offertory. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us to do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the end of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you've refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.